Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, yeah, so my name is Joseph Isak. I'm a, a PhD student in the Anginant Lab at the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering at Cornell. And I'm going to talk about life cycle assessment and also economic assessment of uh, New York State farms employing co-digestion. And so just before I start, you've probably heard a lot about digesters so far, and this, you know, both sides of the story, everyone has their opinion. Some, some are in favor, others are not in favor. And I would say that I'm very much in favor, and, and I think that even those that said that they're not in favor are not, uh, it's not that they don't believe in the technology, it's the policy and it's the implementation that's the problem, not, not the technology itself. So. My clicker's not working. Uh, use this. Okay. okay, so I'm going to start out uh, by listing the main points. This, they're just ideas. I heard this is a good way to start presentations to give the main points for people to have in their mind before you get into the details and the results. Um, helps the message sink in better. And so uh, my first point is that um, our reliance on co-digestion in, in the United States, because it's tipping fee revenue, is leading to greater environmental emissions downstream. Uh, second main point, that the financial support for digestion te technology should be allocated in ways that incentivize greater performance. Right now, what's generally being done is you're given grants for covering some of the capital costs, and I understand it's very helpful, right, to get over that initial hurdle, but after that digester is built, there's no incentive for them to keep that digester running to produce m more, more electricity or anything like that. And if we had something like a feed-in tariff system where that kind of better performance was rewarded, then I think that we would end up with more efficient systems and, um, and also greater environmental performance as well. Uh, you look at it in European countries where they have primarily feed-in tariff systems, they also offer bonuses on addition to um, the feed -in, uh, the, like the base feed-in tariff rate based on uh, how the farmers are implementing their biogas systems. Like for example, if they choose to install a cover on their digestive storage, they get an extra two cents for every kilowatt hour they produce. That's a good way of encouraging by positive reinforcement um, better management practices on the farm, which is something that we all need. I think. Okay, so, and finally, um, these tipping fee costs, which are a major source of revenue, when you talk about co-digestion, um, do not account for the composition of that waste. They're just treated on a quantity basis, so like a per ton basis, which I think is um, not really fair. If you look at any wastewater treatment facility, if they bring industry waste on, into their tr treatment plant, they're going to charge that industry based on what's in that material, how much nutrients are in there, what is the energy content, what is the organic load. This is important. They recognize that downstream, these nutrients are going to have operational costs. And the cost up front should reflect that nutrient load and also the, um, and the organic load. So that's another main point. Moving on. So I think everyone at least vaguely familiar with what anaerobic digestion is, uh, but uh, basically it's a biological treatment technology that uses a mixed community of bacteria in an anaerobic environment to break down organic material. Um, and one of the byproducts of this process is biogas, which is an energy carrier. Um, but it's been shown in many studies before where they compare farms with and without digesters that, uh, generally speaking, um, digesters cut down in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it definitely leads to odor reduction. Those volatile organic compounds that are, you, you associate with raw manure, right, those are also broken down and um, this make your neighbors happy. Uh, and it's really important. Also, energy production, obviously, um, it's a big one. And then also uh, waste stabilization. This over, gets overlooked oftentimes, but I really look at digesters as a waste treatment process. And so what, what you get out of a digester is you get breaking down of these, these organic mo molecules into a form that's less uh, problematic for the environment. So those are the main advantages of digestion. Um, the story of anaerobic digestion in the U.S. is kind of a sad one. Um, there's this, these are, this is a picture of um, installations throughout the, the country. The blue pins represent those installations that are on dairy farms or treating dairy manure principally. Um, and it, may, it might look impressive. I look a lot of that. So there's like maybe 300. I don't know. This is not updated. Um, but that's actually not very much, considering that there's over 8,000 farms, as estimated by some government agency, that could technically support digesters. So 300, less than 300 probably out of 8,000, that's not a very good batting average, uh, in my opinion. Um, and so one of the, some of the barriers behind the adoption of digestion are high capital costs, that's been mentioned already, 
Um, also, I really think that electricity prices are under-subsidized here. Um, that's another major cost. They're not, farmers are not really being compensated for this uh, service they're providing in the form of electricity production. And then also, um, when you're just looking at manu dairy manure, this is material that's already been digested once by a cow and useful energy has been extracted, right? And you're just left with the, uh, what comes out. Um, and so you don't get a lot of energy from it compared to other organic materials. And so the main point I'd like to make is that, and this is a generalization, that um, revenue from just electricity production alone, using dairy manure alone as a, as a substrate, is, is usually not sufficient to cover the cost associated with running a digester. Okay, underline that. Okay, so I, I thought it was um, funny hearing the other day that uh, the USDA is planning to install 500 digesters in 10 years, and they said this is a very ambitious goal. And I just found this graph last night. This is what's been done in Germany in a couple of decades. Um, <laughs> let's just take a 10-year span, say 2000. They had maybe 1,000 digesters. If you go 10 years out from that, 2010, they have over 5,000. That's 4,000 digesters in 10 years. That's eight times what we're proposing to do. So that gives us a little indication of our level of ambition for really adopting digestion and the government's support for it. And I should say, in some years, they did over 1,000, so it's pretty impressive. Okay, co-digestion is briefly defined. Um, it's still based on anaerobic digestion, but it means you're, mu you're digesting multiple materials at one time, not just dairy manure. Um, and there's some advantages to this, namely, you get generally higher energy yields, so you're bringing, like, food waste in, and that, that food or that uh, waste has a lot of methane yielding potential per volume compared to dairy manure. So you make better use of your digester volume. You don't need to build a bigger digester. You just get more methane per volume, right? So higher energy yield. And then even more importantly is the tipping fee revenue, right? And this is um, a much greater source of revenue compared to the energy production that you might get through co-digestion. Some of the ma main disadvantages are the nutrients that you're bringing onto the farm. So um, these, so everyone gets really excited when they see the upfront value of this, these tipping fee revenues when they think about co-digestion, it's very lucrative. But very often you overlook the downstream costs associated with handling all these additional nutrients. And, and the same with environmental emissions. These don't get accounted for, really. But I'm going to make the argument that with some materials, you can actually be paying more for handling that material than you get up front. Um, and again, another disadvantage is that you bring more material in general on the farm. It's more volume that you have to handle downstream. <clears throat> Okay, so what inspired me to do this uh, particular research? I'm actually a lab person. I, I'm not a modeler. I'm learning how to do that. Um, and I, I actually ran small-scale digesters in the lab, uh, treating dairy manure, looking at different co-digestion scenarios, treating different types of organic wastes. I looked at food waste. Um, it's a pretty common co-substrate that's used during, uh, for co-digestion. I also look at this uh, protein-rich material and also crude glycerol, which is a a byproduct of biodiesel manufacturing. Um, it's really energy dense. It's almost like a syrup material. Um, and I compared those three different materials um, and how they performed when, when mixed with dairy manure. Um, and so obviously you get a lot of more methane yield uh, for these substrates compared to manure. Manure is the red and these are the other substrates corresponding to the colors here. So that's one of the advantages as I mentioned earlier. But um, further analysis, I did some characterization of these materials. And I was looking at, like I said, the total nitrogen content. So this is that protein-rich material that has a much higher nitrogen load than your crude glycerol, right? So that's going to have implications downstream. Um, then I looked at energy content. Complete opposite story. Very low energy here. This is very dilute. It's almost like a very thin soup. Um, and compare that to glycerol, which is like almost the fuel in it of itself. So that's, that was interesting. How is that going to play out in a digester scenario? Um, then you look at uh, the maximum loader rate. So with digesters, um, they can handle almost any type of organic material, but they can only add, handle so much so fast. And there's a certain up upper limit as to the throughput of a material that you can add to a digester before the digester becomes unstable. And so we call that the maximum loading rate. And because this hydrolysate is so dilute, um, you can afford to add a lot of it on a volumetric basis. Um, whereas with crude glycerol, you cannot. So this has got implications for the amount of tipping fee revenues that you can get, right? So there's all these different uh, interactions here. I was wondering how that would all play out um, when you compare substrates side by side. Um, which, which are the better substrates um, for co-digestion when you consider all the factors? 
Okay, and so a good way to do this type of, or answer this type of question is by life cycle assessment. I think everyone is also familiar with this uh, uh, tool. It's, it's basically an accounting process looking at all the emission flows, all the material flows, energy flows, and when you're doing an economic life cycle assessment, you're also keeping track of the revenue and the cost flows from the beginning of the production process all the way through its use phase until the end of life. And then at the end of the day, you come up with an aggregated score and you can compare two different scenarios side by side. Okay, so a typical manure management is a mass flow, right, for those that have digesters. Um, manure is collected from the barn, it's put into a reception pit where it can maybe mixed and diluted with water. You might add your co-substrates here. Um, then it goes into your digester, right? So the slurry comes out and put in some kind of storage. That can be a closed storage or it can be open storage. Most often it's open storage. Um, and then that, mer that slurry is then applied to the land just like, um, just like regular raw manure. And, uh, and in the case where you have more manure than you have land, you have to export that material, which has obviously monetary and environmental costs. So that's the material flow. If you look at the energy flow, you get biogas. Uh, it's the energy carrier that comes off the digester. That's typically fed to a combined heat and power engine where some of the heat is uh, returned back to the digester to keep it warm um, in order to keep the bugs happy. And then uh, some, the rest of that heat is usually uh, sent to a radiator where it's just kind of dumped to the atmosphere, not used for anything else. Um, when you do co-digestion, because you're getting much more methane per reactor volume, you actually end up with a considerable amount of, of excess heat there. Um, and then obviously electricity is one of the main byproducts too when you do CHP. So the net metering thing is what I think is uh, a bit of a problem um, in, in the US. So uh, the way it works is uh, the energy that you produce from your CHP, the electricity can be used to offset electricity demand on the farm. And that's just the same as displacing the value of electricity at its premium cost. But any additional electricity that you produce and you feed back into the grid, is you only pay typically the wholesale value of electricity, which is a couple of cents per kilowatt hour. It's, it's very nominal and, um, as you see later, not adequate um, to cover the cost of the digester. And some of the research I'm doing, I don't have time to go into it in this presentation, is actually to look at various ways that we can uh, recover more of this energy that's originally bound up in biogas, namely to capture this excess heat and use it for cooling. So um, these absorption chillers are, it's called a passive cooling system. Unlike um, your typical refrigerator, which uses electricity to drive the compression cycle, this is a passive system that doesn't use electricity, that just uses differences in vapor pressures of a working solution. Um, and it's really great if you have an abundance of low quality heat, like you might get off of CHP. And so we're thinking, wow, you can do heat, you can do electricity and you can do cooling. Cooling is a really important utility in farms. Very often gets overlooked. Um, and I, before I go on, I just want to point, this is not new. This is not a new technology. This is not like, this has been around for over 50 years and it's been pioneered by the um, Carrier Corporation in Syracuse. Um, it's nothing new. The problem is it's, it's, it has a high capital cost. But in, in cases where there's high electricity prices, like in cities, and like I said, if you have a lot of waste heat, this starts to become economical. But anyway, um, we're going to look at generating cooling for various applications on the farm because it is important, right? You can use it to cool milk. And I'll refer you to a, a subsequent presentation by one of my colleagues, Christy Prana, who's actually going to look at using that cooling to cool cows and, and mitigate heat stress in a process called conductive cooling. So we're just trying to tie all the ends together and make these systems more efficient. The idea here, at least with the conductive cooling, is that if you can, produ if you can save milk production, right, that's a source of revenue there. It's much more, uh, you get much more for that revenue than, say, the electricity you get that you produce. So we're going to explore that possibility um, of maybe uh, making digesters more economical. So here's my main research question in the study is, uh, what is the consequence of employing co-digestion on New York State dairy farms rather than just doing monodigestion of manure only? And I don't have time to go into the secondary research questions, but uh, I'm looking at various management strategies um, surrounded surrounding the, the digester, like you know whether you do solid separation or storage cover or uh, different um, land application practices to see how they all compare. And I'm doing this both from an environmental point of view and also an economic one. And the important thing when you do these combined environmental economic assessments is that you have to uh, be using the same 
system, like the same scope, the same system boundaries. Um, and that's what I described here. I'm not going to list them because they're too long. The important ones is that uh, you have to define the main function of your, of your technology. In this case, like what, what, what service is it providing? And I'm calling that, it's producing, I'm calling it an energy production system, producing one kilowatt hour of, of methane energy. Everything is normalized, all scenarios are normalized to that basic functional unit. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the energy performance first. Um, I'm gonna unpack this graph for you. Um, let me show you what, what it shows. So everything, again, is on a per kilowatt hour of methane basis. All these different types of fuels that come off the process are all put into the units of kilowatt hours, right? Um, this gray bar represent, a gray line represents the net amount of recovered energy, not the net amount of energy produced, but the energy that's actually captured and used to generate revenue on the farm. So if you look in the case of CHP, you get uh, electricity and heat but that heat is not used, it's just dumped. So it's not recovered, it's not used for revenue. So I don't carry that through the process. But um, anyway, so what is below the zero line here represents parasitic energy usages. So this is like energy that's you know, from the initial methane um, that drops down your, your net. And at the end of the, the process, when you go all the way to digestive export, this represents your, your net uh, energy recapture at the end of the day. So you know, you start out with 100% methane energy. At the end of the day, after you account for all the parasitic losses along the way, you end up at this value. And as you can see from with manure, it's only 10%. You only get 10% of the original energy contained in the methane, which is not very good, but it's still positive at least. Okay, so I'm looking at the different scenarios here. This is food waste, um, and you might have noticed that these parasitic energy. I'll just go back one, forth here. You can see how it changes. Um, the parasitic energy usages are proportionally less. This is because you're getting greater uh, effective use of your digester volume. This is a more energy-rich material. You have the same size digester, so it has the same electricity requirements and same heating requirements, but you're getting more methane out per volume. And so that leads to a better overall performance here. You get 20% of recovered energy, <laughs> right? twice the amount you get from the manure. Now I look at hydrolysis. This is a material that had high nutrients, very low energy content, very dilute. And because it's so dilute, that's that much more material that you have to feed up, right? So it goes into the digester, you have to bring the digester temperature up to a certain temperature. If you're feeding in a, a lot of, essentially, water, right? Water has a high heating capacity, uh, so you have to spend more, there's a higher parasitic heat use for that material. And the big point here is that because this material has so many nutrients, you don't, you no longer have the land available to deal with those nutrients. You have to actually ex start exporting your material, and this is the liquid fuel cost associated with that. You can see that this value is almost zero. And I can imagine there could be substrates out there that are even worse in terms of nutrient load and energy quality that actually would cause a negative um, net energy balance. So you have to question whether or not it makes sense to, to be treating these materials on farms. No. Glycerol, this is the opposite. This is low nutrient, high energy density. And you can see that these parasitic uh, energy flows are essentially zero, right? And you have a really high energy recovery. Now I just, I mentioned earlier, looking at ways you can use this combined heat and power, this heat, um, if you did an absorbent chilling, you could recover roughly 70% of that energy, right? And you can use that cooling for various purposes on the farm. And that bumps your net energy recovery to over 40%, which is pretty respectable, right? Um, so that's an interesting finding. Now I'm moving into the environmental performance. Um, I did a I used software, Lucima Pro, to do this, and um, and I did a I actually used the IFSM model initially to kind of feed my model, um, and I did all like an uncertainty analysis. Um, and these are I just want to point out the error bars here. Obviously, I'm not expecting you to interpret this graph. Only to point out that there is a considerable amount of uncertainty associated with this life cycle, um, but that you can still kind of tell that um, this glycerol, which is the orange bars outperforms the hydrolysates uh, in almost all cases, right? Um, if you look on, on average, right, it's doing the best. But if you look from an economic standpoint, it's a different story. So this is just manure. So uh, above the zero line represents um, your revenue sources. And I, I really simplified my model. Just I, I didn't look at bedding. I didn't look at uh, any other, like selling fertilizers or anything like this, just the bare minimum electric revenue from electricity, from tipping fees, and from fertilizer, 
um, and, and those cash flows are, are represented by positive values, um, and then these are each one of those individual um, process stages um, and their associated costs. Those are the negative values, and the black bars represent the net cash flow before taxes. And you can see that with, with manure only, that's you come up with a negative number that you've heard that in other presentations. For, um, I should point out that I haven't subtracted out the, the costs associated with um, normal manure management. So, I mean, farmers have to spend money to deal with manure anyway, right? And I didn't subtract that out, but still this number would be negative. Um, and then I want to talk, really point out the co-digestion scenarios here. So the blue bar, which you almost barely see, is the revenue you get from electricity. Um, the orange bar represents the revenue you get from tipping fees. And you can see how important that is in, with some substrates, right, which are, you can afford to add uh, in high mass loading rates. And basically, that's where, where the revenue is coming from. Electricity doesn't matter, at least not at, at the, the prices that uh, the farmers are getting paid for the electricity they produce. And the real crime here, so this is the worst, this is the most economically profitable. It's the worst for the environment, though. Um, this is glycerol, this is like a fuel. It's almost like bringing fuel onto your farm. You're getting paid to do it, and still you, you almost end up with a, a net zero uh, economic gain. Um, that seems backwards to me. <laughs> Uh, I hope it does to you. And I'm going to do some simple math just to just to hammer home this point. Um, why I say electricity prices are under subsidized here. So um, we can talk the marginal cost for CHP capacity is about thousand dollars per kilowatt hour. And before I get into this further, I want to say so like with the di like the way I modeled this is with the with the glycerol that produces a lot of extra methane, and I assume that you scale up your your uh, CHP engine in order to meet that extra methane production. So you're, you're, make, you're putting in a bigger CHP engine, right? Um, so if you were to do a cost analysis of that, you look at the cost associated with um, adding another kilowatt hour capacity to your CHP engine. That costs you about $1,000, right? Um, then you look at the wholesale value of electricity. It's about three cents per kilowatt hour. You do a calculation here to see what the maximum amount of energy you could generate if you had that one kilowatt hour being run every hour of the year, <laughs> and uh, you get something like 8,760 kilowatt hours per year. That's the most you could possibly hope to produce. But as you've heard from other stories, digesters aren't running all the time. There's problems. They go down. So you have to factor in the runtime efficiency. I think 80% having a digester or a CHP running 80% is pretty, uh, it's pretty conservative or optimistic, rather. Um, and that represents the amount of energy you can get. So $1,000 um, revenue from CHP. So that's the max amount of energy you could produce from that one kilowatt hour. But you're only running at 80% of the time, and you're getting three cents per kilowatt hour. That amounts to a cost of $210. <laughs> Whereas you're spending $1,000 for that action capacity. It would take you five years. This doesn't even account for the cost associated with running your, your CHP the maintenance costs and everything else. That's just the capital cost difference um, for that extra kilowatt hour. How the hell are, are farmers going to be able to, um, you know, pay, pay off a digester at this rate, at this value of electricity? They're not. It's not possible. Okay, I'm, I'm just jumping around here. And so um, the nice thing about LCA, how am I doing on time? One more minute to finish my screen point. Perfect. Okay, so um, nice thing about LCA is that you can start playing around with some of the input parameters. You can see which, which parameters are most responsible for affecting the performance of a system, right? We call that sensitivity analysis. You can also do that with the economics. And so I just did a you know, quick uh, analysis of uh, what, like the tipping fee value they would need to break even, accounting for all the, the downstream costs associated with handling that material. And food waste was kind of like middle of the road. Actually, this is pretty high. I don't think a lot of farmers see this amount for, for food waste. Uh, hydrolysate, again, this is bad. This is the worst for the environmentally speaking, um, but uh, because it's so, you can add so much of it to your digester, um, you can afford to only get paid $13 per ton. Uh, and glycerol, the most valuable, really the, the best material for, for digestion is you would need to be paid $10, $110 per ton. That is backwards in my opinion. I think that's pretty crazy. Um, and so uh, some of the other sensitive parameters I looked at were livestock intensity. So um, this is the amount of cows you have for the amount of crop area on the farm, and as you can imagine, when you look at co-digestion and you talk about bringing nutrients onto the farm, 
those farms that don't have a lot of land area already are going to have to are going to bear more of a, a burden with these nutrient rich substrates um, because they have to deal with export and that's what this uh, graph is showing here and some other important parameters are the transport distance um, and that kind of thing so uh, yeah I think that's the end okay bring home the, the main point so if, if farmers um, are considering doing co-digestion uh, some pointers as to how they can appraise that material if it's a good material or not it's not looking at the upfront costs right um, is to look at these characteristics the energy content how much methane it can produce right per volume um, also the amount of nutrients it contains um, that's going to be really important for downstream costs and then uh, finally it's loading right this is important for tipping free revenue so farmers you know it's not just the upfront value that you get for tipping fees it's you have to consider all these other factors and that's what I hope to convey in this presentation. So I'd like to thank everyone that was involved, my advising committee, and Kurt and everyone else. So uh, thank you very much.